Welcome back. Today we're going to talk about the second part of what a sampling distribution is. We're going to start by talking about what is our goal with doing a sampling distribution. And really a sampling distribution is going to allow us to evaluate claims uh, that have to do with you know, percentages or something that someone says. And we're going to come behind that claim, pull a sample of our own and ask the question, if this was really true, if this claim was true, how unlikely or likely is the result that I got? Let's look at evaluating a claim. When we evaluate a claim, the first thing that we're going to do is assume the claim is true. And to build and to build a, a sampling distribution of what's possible. So to see what is actually possible if this claim is true, we are going to create a simulated sampling, sampling distribution. When we do that, it's going to give us the list of possibilities, not a list, but um, a an idea of what the possibilities are of possible outcomes. And then we're going to evaluate what the percent chance of what I got happening compared to what was possible in that sampling distribution. So in step three, we're going to find percent chance of getting observed result. It looks something like this. We have a sampling distribution here with a certain number of points on it. This is the simulated sampling distribution. Somewhere along this continuum, we have what is our observed result. So what we got when we actually did the, actually did the experiment. So for example, down below in this check your understanding, this person has a big giant pot of pennies. And so there's a claim about the certain percentage of pennies that are prior to 1982. There's a claim out there that it's 13.2%. Well, what I'm going to do is assume that claim is true, that there's 13.2% of those pennies that are prior to 1982 pennies. I'll create a sampling distribution that looks exactly like, or, or that looks, that, that shows, it lays out what it looks like to have a distribution of samples where the true claim is that there's 13.2%. Then I actually reach into the pot and pull out 50 pennies and see what percentage do I actually get? That is our observed result. The observed result is what I actually get. I then measure my observed result on the list in terms of the number of dots above or below it to see how likely or unlikely is it that I got my result given the results in the simulated sampling distribution. So if I count the percent of dots at my level or at my observed result or more extreme, that's going to tell me how unlikely my result is. So if the result that I got falls into this bigger collection of dots over here, meaning what I got was not all that crazy, it's not all that unlikely, then I would say, I think the claim might be true. I have sufficient evidence to support the claim. But if my result fell into this area over here, then I have a highly unlikely result, meaning that my percent of pennies that I got doesn't really happen all that often if the true percentage is 13.2%. So in summation, the general level that we use is a 5% level. So if it's a less than 5% chance, there's convincing evidence against the claim. If 
it's greater than 5%, meaning it happened quite a bit. There's convincing evidence. There's not convincing evidence. against the claim, okay? So there's a 5% threshold where my result is sitting there, and if my result was unlikely, meaning it happened less than 5% of the time compared to the simulated result, that's gonna give me convincing evidence that it might not have happened. We're gonna look at this example and you're gonna see how this works. Like we talked about before with check your understandings, make sure that you try this on your own. You can come back and watch my explanation. Pennies made prior to 1982 were made of 95% copper. Because of their copper content, these pennies are worth about 2.3 cents each. Pennies made after 1982 are only 2.5% copper. Jenna reads online that 13.2% of pennies in circulation are pre-1982 copper pennies. Jenna has a large container of pennies at home. She, does, or she selects a random sample of 50 pennies from the container and finds that 11 are pre-1982 copper pennies. Does this provide convincing evidence that the proportion of pennies in her container that are pre-1982 copper pennies is greater than 13.2%? Essentially what happens is she reads this claim online. She pulls out a handful of pennies and finds that she has by far more pennies that are pre-1982. So she wonders to herself, hmm, I wonder if that's weird. I wonder if I have a higher percentage or I wonder if the claim isn't true. Meaning I wonder if... I got this result. Is it really true that that 13.2% could be true? So in situations like this, we need to look at what's our population? What is our sample? Our population in this case is all pennies in the container. And the parameter to measure that would be P is equal to 0.132, 13.2%. Our sample is the 50 pennies that we pulled out. Our statistic would be p hat equal to 11 over 50, which is what she got when she pulled out her sample, which is equal to 0 0.22. The p hat represents a statistic, a statistic in this case. So number two says, does she have some evidence? Not necessarily, they're not asking us about convincing evidence. That's a different question. But does she have some evidence that more than 13.2% of her pennies are pre-1982 copper pennies. Well, put yourself in her shoes. She wonders if it's true. So she runs this tiny little experiment, grabbing some out, and she sees that she has by far more, almost twice as much. So I would say, yes, she does. I would feel that way because in her sample, 22% of the pennies are pre-1982. So what are the reasons why this could happen? These are the two same two reasons that we're gonna use throughout this course to talk about why a claim might be true if it goes against what we see in the claim. Provide two explanations for the evidence described in number two. Well, one, maybe, just maybe the container actually does contain 13.2% of, of copper of pre-1982 pennies. And her sample, she's just lucky. She just happens to have quite a few more. So maybe the true proportion of pre-1982 pennies is 13.2%, and her sample was lucky, meaning she's got a bunch of those more expensive pennies in there. The other thing that could be true, so maybe her sample's just weird. Maybe this is a weird sample. The other possibility is that the claim is weird. The claim is wrong. And so there's truly not a 13.2% chance. So the percent... So only one of two things happens when we get a result that's inconsistent with the claim. Either the claim is wrong or the sample was weird. Down below, 
we use technology to simulate selecting 100 simple random samples of size 50 from a population of pennies in which 13.2% are pre-1982 copper pennies. The dot plot shows P hat, the sample proportion of copper pennies for each of the 100 samples. Let's talk about a couple of notes on this one. This is a simulation. So this right here is one sample of 50 pennies, and it's not real. It was created using a, a computer simulation in which the proportion they were pulling from was 13.2%. We're going to use the simulation and compare it to what actually happened when Jenna reached her hand into the, into the, the pot. So there's one dot on the graph at 22%. Uh, that's right here. Explain what it means. That's one sample of 50 pennies. Where the proportion of pre- 1982 pennies is 22%, okay? In number five, it says, assuming that 13.2% of pennies in circulation are pre-1982 copper pennies, is it surprising to randomly select 50 pennies for which P is equal to 22% or greater? Let's look at what that means on our graph over here. So in order for us to select 22% or greater, we go to our 22% line, it's only this, 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 or this. Everything else over here is less than 22%. Okay, everything else over here is less than 22%. The stuff over here is greater than 22% or equal to, right? Because we have one on 22%. So what does this mean? Well, it means that we, yes, it is surprising because only four of a hundred or four percent of samples were 22 percent or greater so here's the pa stay resistance this is the interpretation this is what we're trying to build to so based on our previous answers, is there convincing evidence that more, .2, more than 13.2% of pennies in Jenna's container pre-1982 are copper pennies? Explain your reasoning. So let's just say we have this simulation here. And in the simulation, Jenna's result is highly unlikely. So what we say is, if the claim is true that 13.2% of pennies are pre-1982, it is so unlikely that Jenna grabbed a sample out of there, meaning it, there's only a 4% chance that she grabbed a sample out of there that had 22% pre-1982 pennies. How do we use that result to do interpretation? Well, what we'd say is yes, there is convincing evidence because assuming Jenna's container contained 13.2% pre-1982 pennies. There is only a 4% chance of pulling a sample with 22% pre-1982 not 1892 1982 or more purely by chance so because compared to a simulation what actually happened was very, very unlikely. We would say we have convincing evidence against the claim. We have convincing evidence against the claim that 13.2% of pennies in circulation or in this jar are pre-1982, okay? That is the second part of 
sampling distributions. I hope you learned something here. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.